We have Marjorie Spruill, who's here tonight to discuss her book, Divided We Stand, which gives an account of the modern women's rights movement and a conservative movement that rose in opposition. The centerpiece of this story of great leaps for women's rights, unity, and deep divisions is the often tumultuous state and national women's conferences that expose those divisions, culminating in the 1977 National Women's Conference in Houston, which Spruce argues is a major but often overlooked turning point in American politics. I'll leave it to her to tell us why. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book and was moved to read it at my desk, pencil in hand, taking notes. It deserves the great reception it's received and to echo a line from a review published in Caucus, there are indeed countless kernels of amazing achievement and courage throughout this jam-packed, engaging history. Marjorie Spruill is Professor Emerita at the University of South South, South Carolina, where she taught courses in women's history, Southern history, and recent American history before retiring earlier this year. She is the author of New Women of the New South and the editor of several anthologies, including One Woman, One Vote and the South in the History of the Nation. Her research for Divided We Stand was supported by the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, and the Ger Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation. She lives in South Carolina. Please join me in welcoming Marjorie Spruill to Politics and Prose. Right. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Nice to meet you. Um, thank you for this invitation to speak at this hallowed Washington institution. Very happy to be here to talk to you about this new book. Um, I was supposed to be here in March and it, there you was snowed out. Uh, there's not any such problem today. So I think we will be just fine, yes. Divided We Stand began as a study of a series of federally funded state and national conference in 1977. Uh, as Numa told you, these were known as the International Women's Year or the IWI conferences because of their UN connections. They became lightning rods for cultural politics. As I learned more about the events that gave rise to these extraordinary, if poorly remembered events, and began to understand the nature and extent of their impact, the book grew into a story of a transformational decade, the 1970s, and a struggle between two women's movements that I argue played a crucial role in the development of modern political culture. These International Women's Year conferences, sponsored by Congress, were organized by presidentially appointed commissions named by Republican President Gerald Ford and then when power uh, transferred to Jimmy Carter by, by him. Inspired by the UN's internationally, International Women's Year Conference in Mexico City in 1975, where participating nations all came together to devise a world plan of action to improve women's lives Feminist leaders in the United States, such as Bella Abzug and Patsy Mink, proposed that we hold gatherings like that in the United States, in every state and territory, to allow the women of this nation to play a role in devising future policies that would affect them. So it was a unique event in American life where the federal government paid for women to gather to tell the government what they wanted the government to do. At the state meetings that were the preliminary meetings leading up to a big national meeting, the participants would come together, debate the issues, and vote on resolutions and delegates that they would send on to the culminating national convention, which took place eventually in Houston, Texas in November of 1977. And there they were to vote on a national plan of action that was supposed to be a blueprint to guide Congress and the President. Altogether, 
these state and, and territorial conferences and the national conferences attracted over 150,000 participants. What happened that made it so volatile was that feminists and social conservatives turned out at these state meetings in huge numbers to compete, to control the conferences, and therefore the plan that was going to be created. Women's rights supporters, with their initial advantage as the organizers, prevailed at these conferences for the most part, uh, in the end electing about 80% of the delegates. And so the plan that they adopted in Houston turned out to be decidedly feminist. But the interesting thing about it is that in this volatile contest, this explosive series of events, both sides claimed victory. Gloria Steinem spoke thereafter of the National Women's Conference as a constitutional convention for women. And more remarkably, the sort of milestone that divides our sense of time. On the other hand, Conservative leader Phyllis Schlafly, who as you may know, died just this past September at the age of 92, insisted throughout her long life that the IWI was a major strategic blunder by feminists that played right into her hands, that it sealed the fate of the ERA even as it gave rise to the pro-family movement. Now, that both sides assigned the IWI such historic significance and that both sides claimed it as a victory is what really caught my attention and suggested that there was a wider story that needed to be investigated. So, after years of research, of trying to make sense of all of this, the story became more clear. Envisioned by feminists, as a means of expanding and diversifying the women's movement. The IWI conferences had that effect, but they also greatly strengthened the feminist opponents. Much of the book, Divided We Stand, is spent explaining how the conferences mobilized, unified, and galvanized both the feminist and the conservative women and proved to be profoundly polarizing events with enduring consequences. The title of the book refers to the fact we, you know, authors always love a double entendres, right? Uh, how many book titles have you heard that had these double meanings? So clever. But what I was thinking of is that as women stood up in the 70s to demand more political power and attention to their concerns, they were extraordinarily divided and that the issues that divided women in the 70s would polarize the nation. Thus, in 2016, during the election, and still today, we as a nation stand divided and perhaps as polarized as we have ever been in the history of the United States. Now, to understand how the IWI took place, I realized that I had to turn back to an earlier period, to the early 70s, and in the process rediscovered a time in our own recent history and my own adult life that is so different from the present as to be almost unbelievable when the modern women's rights movement enjoyed widespread support among Republicans and Democrats alike. Feminists were highly visible in both parties and they were working together in bipartisan uh, organizations, including the National Women's Political Caucus that was founded in 1971. All three branches of the federal government acted in support of feminist goals. Even Richard Nixon, though no friend of feminist, in fact, Bella Abzug, I always referred to him as America's number one chauvinist pig, felt obliged to cater to them, believing that that was what women voters wanted. During the 92nd Congress, 1971 to 72, more women's rights uh, legislation was passed than in all previous congressional sessions combined. And that included uh, the very important Title IX banning 
discrimination, sex discrimination in education at all levels. Uh, best known for its impact on sports, less well known for the fact that it banned sex role stereotyping, therefore affecting our minds. The most dramatic evidence of congressional support for women's rights was the overwhelming approval by dramatic margins of the proposed Equal Rights Amendment, which of course we all know was a key goal of the women's rights movement. Within a, only eight senators voted against it, and it had overwhelming support in the House as well. And then the states scrambled to ratify, sort of falling all over each other uh, in the effort to be the first, or one of the first. And within a year, 30 of the 38 states that were needed for it to be ratified had approved it. Then the judicial system was getting in on the act. And of course, the most dramatic example of that was in 1973 when the Supreme Court issued the Roe v. Wade decision making abortion legal. And polls showed that the majority of Americans believed that abortion should be legal in some form. And so, not without its critics, without passionate internal divisions, and appealing to a large degree to white, middle, and upper class women. In this period, the feminist movement had many victories and a transformative impact on American society. Meanwhile, conservative women were quietly simmering, angry, that national politicians seem to accept the feminists as speaking for all American women. Phyllis Schlafly, a seasoned Republican activist from her party's far right, quickly emerged as the leader of the conservatives and founded the organization Stop ERA, which of course stood for Stop Taking Our Privileges. A skilled organizer, a strategist, a great debater, very effective in working with the press. Schlafly tutored ERA opponents, many of them complete novices in politics, about how to lobby, how to organize press conferences, even what to wear on TV. She inspired and empowered her followers and they loved her for it. In fact, they loved her just as much as feminists despised her. And feminists despised her for her hostile and her sarcastic tone that tended to color the whole debate on women's issues and also for her hypocrisy and for her success. By 1975, the conservatives had managed to stall the ERA bandwagon four states short of the three-fourths that are needed for an amendment to become part of the Constitution. And for the first time, uh, it was beginning to seem as though this, what was absolutely sure to happen, of the ERA becoming part of the, con the Constitution, was in doubt. And in that same year, Schlafly decided to go beyond just the effort to stop the ERA uh, and, to, and created what she called the Eagle Forum, offering it as an alternative to women's lib. The organization appealed especially to Christian conservatives who saw themselves as defenders of traditional morality, of family values, and convinced and, and empowered largely by this sense that God was on their side as they took up this battle against ungodly feminism. Still, at mid-decade in 1975, Feminists remained very optimistic, uh, correctly interpreting Schlafly and her views as those of a distinct minority, but incorrectly assuming that her movement would go away. At mid-decade, the feminist movement continued to have strong support in Congress and in President Ford, whose wife Betty, as we all know, was an ardent feminist. And in 1975, President Gerald Ford established the IWI program with moderate Republican feminist Jill Ruckelshaus in charge. Conservative women were furious, appalled and angry 
at the establishment of the feminist-dominated IWI program with its $5 million appropriation from Congress. In their view, they said, if there had been any doubt that the federal government was taking one side in a big national debate about the role of women, the creation of the IWI Commission, and the funding of these Congress, uh, these things, uh, all led by feminists, removed any shadow of the doubt. Creation of the federally funded program heightened tensions between the feminists and conservatives and propel these opposing movements that were already embattled over the proposed ERA and each of them claiming to represent the majority of American women into a formalized high stakes competition for influence. And these IWI conferences proved to be thoroughly polarizing events. Well, how? How did they polarize women and later the nation? Before 1977, many feminist strategists had sought to disassociate the ERA from other controversial issues, including abortion and gay rights. Said These do not have anything to do with it. Uh, the ERA would not lead to these other things. But during the IWI, they took a different course because as you were putting together this whole national plan of actions with multiple planks, you are linking together automatically uh, many issues, and that included many issues that were anathema to social conservatives, and that included abortion. Perhaps even more controversial, they added to their agenda the issue of protection of the rights of lesbians and gays. So people who were opposed to any of the 26 planks in this platform they put together, uh, including the most hot button issues of the ERA, abortion rights, or gay rights, became allies in that old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Also, IWI opponents attracted a lot of support from advocates, uh, from people who were hostile to big government. Conservatives were further inflamed by feminists, including advocacy in the National Plan of Action of major increases in federal programs and spending that would meet their needs. Secondly, the IWI gave conservatives an absolutely perfect opportunity to organize. There was, of course, one of these IWI contests uh, in every state and territory. And that was in contrast to the fight over the Equal Rights Amendment because, as I just mentioned, a lot of states ratified immediately, some of them within hours or within days, with little or no debate. And so in all those states, there had not been a big fight over the ERA that would have mobilized conservatives. But this is a whole different situation. There was going to be a pre-announced meeting open to all on which these issues would debate, would be decided, and it was conservatives had uh, plenty of time to organize, and they did. Third, this battle against feminism that ensued united religious conservatives whose beliefs included support of traditional patriarchal families. And therefore, in every state, Schlafly and other leaders brought together social conservatives, particularly religious conservatives, in an unprecedented display of unity. And that included conservative Catholics like Schlafly, uh, Protestants such as uh, Church of Christ leader Lottie Beth Hobbs of Texas who had had really mobilized a, a great deal of evangelical uh, and fundamentalists, uh, particularly in the South. It included some Orthodox Jews and the very powerful Mormon church, the LDS. This was the cutting edge of the movement to recruit previously apolitical, evangelical, and fundamentalist Protestants into politics. It was the precursor to what would very soon become known as the religious right. Very troubling 
is that there was also an important racial aspect to this conflict, especially in the South, where white conservatives that were already angry about federal imposition of unwanted social change saw an opportunity. As one white nationalist from Mississippi, Richard Barrett, wrote, it gave them the opportunity to show Washington, D.C. that the people were not the slaves of Washington. And it gave them an opportunity, uh, people who had fought the civil rights movement and been overcome an opportunity to fight back on different terms. Much of the conflict between the feminists and the conservative women took place at the preliminary meetings in the states rather than at the national meeting. And these took place over a long, hot summer in 1977. There was an astounding degree of conflict that I describe in chapters such as Out of the Kitchen and Into the Counter Revolution, and Mama said there'd be days like this. There was one incident in Alabama, for example, where uh, a black woman, a college student, uh, speaking, uh, representing NARAL, National Abortion Rights Action League, um, was slapped across the face by a white Eagle Forum um, rep woman who was sitting next to her. Uh, there were incidents where people tripped people trying to get uh, to the votes. There were pl places where people blocked the access to the polls. Um, it, 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 it really got ugly. And what was happening there is that these warring women's movements were both trying to turn out their troops, to forge coalitions, to gird their loins with the rules of parliamentary procedure, and in every way compete to control these state gatherings and the right to speak for American women. <coughs> Conservative coalitions contesting feminist leadership of the IWI conferences were not all the same in each state, but in some places they attracted support from far-right groups, including the John Birch Society that was heavily engaged in the fight against the Equal Rights Amendment, and many of Schlafly's lieutenants who were leading this movement in several states were John Birch Society members. Uh, also, uh, a, a little-known group from that originated in Mississippi during the James Meredith crisis, known as Women for Constitutional Government, and, and quite a few of, of the, the state leaders were also members of, of that group. Um, the American Party was also getting in on the act. But most shocking is that the Ku Klux Klan claimed that they had infiltrated many of the IWI conferences and claimed to have controlled the conferences in Florida and in Mississippi. In some states, such as Utah, Oklahoma, Mississippi, and Alabama, conservatives to gained total control over the conferences, but they offered a challenge to feminists even in states such as New York, Massachusetts, California, and Hawaii. Hawaii, everybody was going, what? Uh, how did they take over Hawaii, which was thought it was one of the first states to approve the ERA. They had sent Patsy Mink back to Congress again and again. And finally, it, it turns out that the Mormons had bussed large numbers of people from a, a Mormon-owned Polynesian cultural center and had thereby taken over the conferences. It, it, got, to be, it got to the point where, as rumors would spread in a particular state that the conservatives would organize, Feminists, even ones who were more radical and contemptuous of these government-sponsored uh, women's conferences, uh, would cancel their plans and head to the capital cities, you know, to to stand up uh, uh, for what they believed. And it, it really, uh, the accusations and the paranoia and everything uh, was was flying, and the numbers of people attending rising. Conservatives in the end succeeded in electing only 20% of the delegates to the Houston Conference. But they likened this victory to that of David over Goliath. I heard that phrase, or read that phrase, again and again. Feminists, on the other hand, 
denounced the, the conservatives, accusing them of using the IWI conferences and attacks on feminism generally in efforts to reinvigorate the right. Whatever their intentions, it was certainly having that effect. At the culminating National Women's Conference in Houston that November 1977, the massive divisions that had developed between feminist and socially conservative women were on full display. It was a consciousness-raising experience for the whole nation. It was also a media extravaganza, the result of those tumultuous and sometimes violent meetings of the summer which had grabbed the attention of the press. There were over 1,500 applications for press passes. That gives you some idea. From foreign newspapers to small town papers. A-list journalists from the left, the right, and the center flooded into Houston. Among them, well-known figures such as Tom Brokaw, George Will, Sally Quinn, James Kilpatrick, Gail Sheehy, Anna Quinlan, Joe Klein. It attracted women of distinction from many, many fields. It was clear that this was an event that people believed was going to have major historic significance and that uh, women uh, across the nation were, many of them, very, very proud to be associated with. There was this star-studded cast of celebrities that arrived in Houston, including the poet Maya Angelou, who wrote his poem, the new poem specifically for the occasion, tennis pro Billie Jean King, who four years earlier had kicked the butt of Bobby Riggs in Houston, right here where this happened, scholar Margaret Mead, whose, whose, whose writings about how gender roles varied from time to time and place to place around the world, uh, therefore, therefore proving that these were uh, cultural creations, gender roles, was there and, and was just to this crowd just as much of a heroine as Billie Jean King. And then there was Edith Bunker, I mean Jean Stapleton, <laughs> the most beloved housewife in America, uh, the star of the popular sitcom All in the Family, who uh, kind of lent her respectable, non-radical image to the whole occasion and had gone all over the country uh, testifying that had Edith been a real person, she would have been there and loved it. Now, most significantly as far as politics is concerned, um, there was high level bipartisan support. There was no woman who was involved in politics who would have missed this. And they came in, both Democrats and Republicans from all sides, and that included, of course, former First Ladies, Lady Bird Johnson, who was there accompanied by her daughter, of course, Democrats, and Betty Ford, Republican, and they joined Rosalind Carter on the podium. And then there was the First Lady of the Civil Rights Movement, Coretta Scott King, who declared a new harmony among women. IWI leaders had made a concerted effort to attract women of diverse backgrounds, lower income women as well as representatives of every ethnic background. They were trying to also to bring together feminists of all ideas uh, of every stripe and to unite them behind a set of resolutions that represented all of their many needs and goals. And in the process, they succeeded in some of their most cherished goals that they hoped to accomplish out of IWI, and that was to move the movement beyond that white middle class base and past the ideological wrangling that had plagued the women's rights movement earlier in the decade. The National Plan of Action itself, or the plan, was a historically significant document. It incorporated the moderate goals of the founding mothers of the movement from the mid-60s with the ideas of the more radical and younger women who had come into the movement later in the 60s from the anti-war and civil rights movement. A highlight of the conference was when Coretta Scott King 
on behalf of the minority caucus, read the minority rights plank just before it was voted on, concluding with this statement that gives me chill bumps every time I read it. There is a new force, a new understanding, a new sisterhood against all injustice that has been born here, and we will not be divided and defeated again. And as she concluded, the majority of delegates from young radicals and t-shirts to blue-haired ladies rose spontaneously, linked arms, swayed from side to side, and sang, we shall overcome. But solidarity among feminists was hardly the same thing as solidarity among American women, something which Lapley and other social conservatives made crystal clear to the television audiences across the nation. On the other side of the city, just a really six miles away in the Astro Arena, Schlafly led a crowd variously estimated at between 10 or 15 or even 20,000 protesters who had come, uh, buses and cars and charter planes from all over the nation at a massive rally that they call the Pro-Life, Pro-Family Rally. Its purpose was to compete with the National Women's Conference, and there, while the press was all gathered there in that one place, take advantage of that press presence to show that the feminists did not represent them, nor did the National Plan of Action. They also took advantage of that occasion to announce a new determination to roll back feminist gains and to restore American morality and strength through a pro-family movement. The truth of the matter is that uh, though Schlafly often gets credit for this event, it was actually Lottie Beth Hobbs that I mentioned before of, Hughes, of Fort Worth whose idea it was. This was going to be in her state and she was not going to let it go unchallenged. Schlafly was afraid that at the with little notice and with the feminists having tied up every hotel and venue in town, that they just weren't going to be able to put on a big enough show uh, that it would be embarrassing and make them look weak. But the response to this call for conservatives to come in and protest this was, was received extremely well across the nation and people just poured in coming in at their own expense, many of them traveling through the night, attending the rally, getting on the bus, and going home. Uh, the conservative women said, God pulled off a major miracle with a little help from Christian women. And they were so encouraged by this that they believed that, what, that they had a real shot at uh, taking back their country if they only continued to remain politically active. And so at Houston, they announced the beginning of the pro-family movement. So after Houston, what happened? I, I next looked in the book at the period between this November 77 conference and the November 1980 presidential election, which was an extraordinary time in American history, a tectonic shift in our American political culture. Leaving Houston, the feminists were extremely hopeful, very optimistic about implementation of the National Plan of Action, but would face many disappointments. These controversial conferences had led many politicians to doubt that feminists were the women most important to please. A downturn in the economy, combined with Carter's fiscal conservative, left little room for the expanded federal programs recommended in the plan. And when Abzog criticized Carter publicly, he fired her as head of his advisory committee, thereby making her a feminist martyr. Feminists afterwards would continue to fight for the agenda encapsulated in the plan, but without the level of federal support the movement had enjoyed prior to the conference. Many feminists refused to support Carter's reelection. Abzog and quite a few others backed Teddy Kennedy and helped saddle Carter with a platform more radical than he would have liked. When he lost, his aide, Hamilton Jordan, stated that feminists had gotten in Ronald Reagan 
exactly what they deserved. As for the conservatives, after Houston, women of the pro-family movement made major gains. They worked closely with new right leaders who were eager to gain power within the GOP. Schlafly and the conservative women's movement had shown them the potential of gender issues to mobilize and unite Christian conservatives for political action. And using IWI as a rallying cry, they worked hard to register Christian conservatives, new voters, in time for the 1980 election. The new right men, noting the pro-family leader success, courted them avidly, but they also reached out to recruit men ministers such as Jerry Falwell trying to do all they could to keep the religious right active, largely ignoring the fact that Schlafly and the conservative women's movement had shown them the way they would in future years take credit for mobilizing the religious right and with the cooperation, I may add, of many scholars who have continuously overlooked conservative women and underrested their impact on history. The conservative women's success in politicizing and uniting religious conservatives during IWI and over the next few years expanded the ranks of committed conservative activists who found fighting federally funded feminism to be attractive. This included many uh, in the South uh, where Republicans would court voters by invoking the IWI linking together federally supported advocacy of racial equality, radical feminism, and perversity, and try to wrap it all around Jimmy Carter's neck. And despite the fact that he had inherited the IWI, refused to attend, refused to implement many of his recommendations, and fired Abzug they managed to make it seem as if it had all been his idea. Indeed, in the late 70s, what was happening was that gender issues began to replace racial issues as socially acceptable rallying points for social conservatives believing in divinely inspired innate differences and natural hierarchies. IWI, in short, became part of the coded language. At the 1980 Republican National Convention, to the shock and dismay of GOP feminists, pro-family women also persuaded the party to drop its 40-year record of support for the ERA to adopt a strong pro-life position, one that the party has held ever since. And Republican feminists were particularly disturbed that former allies, including George H.W. Bush, who had long supported the ERA and had a moderate position on abortion, was of no help to them at all. In fact, agreeing to fully accept the anti-feminist platform provisions as the price of becoming Reagan's running mate. So in 1980, the platforms of America's two national parties revealed how much things had changed over a decade, how polarized the nation had become over gender issues. The Reagan, Bush, Schlafly, Falwell, GOP vowed as their 1980 campaign buttons declared to make America great again. The 1980 election revealed two trends that proved to be enduring. Women voted in greater numbers than men for the first time and a gender gap favoring Democrats became visible, attributed to the women's movement which had taught women to see their own values in political terms. On the defensive, GOP strategists insisted that the change reflected Democratic men's dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party or admiration for Reagan, a man's man. They also suggested that this phenomenon, the gender gap, was really more of a marriage gap or a racial gap, pointing out correctly that most white married women tended to vote for Republicans. And rather than changing their policies to reach out to progressive women or to minorities, Instead, they relied on symbolic appointments and or rhetoric while doubling down on their appeal to pro-family voters. And for the rest of the 20th century, the GOP would continue to court these voters, becoming increasingly reliant on them and alienating many moderate voters in the process. As conservatives changed parties, 
uh, including a major realignment in the South, the Republican Party became more uniformly conservative and the Democratic Party more uniformly liberal. The Republican Party became more racially and ethnically homogenous, as well as more socially conservative as it doubled down in its defense of the traditional family. For their part, Democrats continued to support women's rights, along with civil rights for African Americans and Hispanics, and to be increasingly supportive of what became known as the LGBT community. And so as issues, including abortion and gay rights, continued at the forefront of national debate, the personal became political, and the political more personal with Democratic and Republican politicians lined up on either side of volatile gender-related issues, they tended to demonize their opponents and define issues strictly in partisan terms, a situation that contributed to political gridlock. And both sides of the battle over women's rights and family values made gains when their party was in power and experienced losses when they were not. The battle between over women's rights and family values continues, fought in many cases by the same warriors, the women of the pro-family movement and their political descendants in groups such as the Eagle Forum have continued to be active and keep the Republicans' feet to the fire. It has struck me again and again how odd it is that pundits who often express wonder that the GOP doesn't track to the left on the women's issue in the face of this widening gender gap, seem not to notice that the Republican Party base includes not only angry white men, but angry white women as well. Schlafly, working through a tech-savvy, well-oiled Eagle Forum, continued to be a force in American politics, a conservative icon regarded as a virtual oracle by many conservatives, while liberals tended to, if they remembered her, they thought she was no longer active. But in her endorsement mattered and was avidly courted. By 2016, like many on the GOP's right, Schlafly was bitter that the party establishment had refused to nominate the most conservative candidate in every election since Reagan. She and others on the right wrote books talking about how much they were determined that their branch of the party was going to pick the nominee in 2016. When she endorsed Donald Trump in early 2016, after he met with her and promised to honor the platform request of the religious right, she played a major role in his selection over Ted Cruz as the party's nominee. Schlafly was a major factor in his getting the nomination. Then Kellyanne Conway, who it seems to me adopted much of Schlafly's style and tactics, even her posture, helped Trump pull victory from the jaws of defeat late in the campaign. And white married women, especially non-college women, made his victory possible. So in conclusion, as pundits and politicians and scholars struggle to understand women in politics today, whether as voters or as candidates, they would do well to pay more attention to the developments of the 1970s when the polarization of feminists and anti-feminists also polarized American political culture, giving rise to the politics of today. Thank you. Now, of course, I want to hear what you think. Uh, Thank you for coming. Yes. I'm, from, I'm from Prince George's County, and I went to the Houston Conference. And there are many people in this room that have. Um, oh, may I ask you to raise your hand if you attended this? Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, let me be the first to invite you to a conference that's going to take place November 5th to the 7th at the University of Houston. And they are putting together all the arrangements yeah, now, and they're really hoping for a, a large uh, contingent of people like you who participated. So Thank you. Ahead. Would you comment on, in my view, the challenge 
of how younger women don't understand that feminist issues are family issues and how they need to be more politically active in my opinion you know in these uh, these elections particularly you know over uh, one of the biggest successes of the conservative women's movement was to demonize the term feminist uh, they did this by virtually ignoring the fact that there was such a thing as moderate feminism and uh, taking the most radical statements by the most radical feminists and put ones that they thought, thought for sure would alienate middle America and advertising those as the avowed goals of the entire movement. And it worked. Um, and uh, over many years, large numbers of young women who have um, embraced many of the goals and the aspirations of the women's rights movement have avoided that term like the plague. Um, like many other college professors, I have seen trends along these lines. And uh, I've always grappled with it by, by saying to myself, um, I, would, I wish that younger women appreciated all of the sacrifices and the struggles that we went through and that we the things we accomplished for them but on the other hand I was very happy that they did not feel the the discrimination as uh, gender discrimination as heavily as we had felt it back when I was young and so it, and in many ways the fact that they disassociated themselves from the movement was a sign that the that times had changed and that things had improved for them and that things however um, in recent years that seems to have changed and even before the 2016 election uh, the term feminism was making a remarkable comeback and uh, it was being embraced by people as diverse as Emma Watson uh, Beyonce, my students all loved it when Beyonce came, and uh, Sarah Palin, and a uh, Feminists for Life organization, which of course is a pro-life uh, organization, Laura Bush, um, and and so the term it has has really changed, and uh, therefore a lot of confusion about it what it actually means, but. <coughs> There, one real test came in the 2016 primaries when a woman was running for president, a liberal feminist woman who made uh, feminism an issue in her came far, ca campaign far more than she had in 2008, <clears throat> really emphasized it, and really appealed to uh, other women, young and old, to rally around her, and older women largely did, and large numbers of younger women didn't. And, and that, of course, as we know, was a big stressor for people uh, and a point of contention. And uh, it was um, something that a lot of, of older baby boomer <laughs> women found hard to, to swallow. Um, but on the other hand, what that, uh, the way I interpreted that is, again, that uh, many of these younger women felt that some of the issues that were being emphasized by Bernie Sanders uh, hit home with them a lot more, including economic inequality and the staggering student loans that, uh, that are oppressing their entire generation. So that was interesting. And so what's really striking is that Hillary Clinton's candidacy did not produce the resurgence of intergenerational feminism that many people had expected. But Trump's election did. And so what that outpouring that we saw back in January, which was uh, huge numbers of older women who demonstrated that being able to crochet was really cool again. <laughs> Turned out in big numbers, 
But the people who were really taking the lead in this were the younger women who had, I believe, developed as a result of his election a very keen sense of um, the fact that they still had some battles to fight. Okay. And I wanted okay. to point out and something, that a real source of strength in terms of dealing with Trump and with the federal government is the fact that during the Kennedy administration, you're too young, but some of us were there. Oh, I'm not. I'm okay. And the other <laughs> thing is, I'll, I'll make it really okay. quick, but uh, Esther Peterson is one of the early names oh, yeah. who we worked for and who appointed me to be the first director of federally employed women in the federal government. Now, that sounds exciting. It wasn't. I was given the, the, the desk behind my boss's secretary. And I was not combined with EEO because they didn't want black women and white women to get together. Furthermore, I knew nothing about the federal government and nothing about women. And that's why they appointed me. But we learned. And we learned because of people that became the, f the federal women's program, Daisy Fields, Ali Latimer Whedon, and some of the others who were before 77. Uh, this was in the late 60s, and Johnson carried it on. But we started with nothing. But federally employed women is like Carter uh, eliminating racism in the, uh, in the <clears throat> military. Federally employed women has gradually eliminated a good part, not all of it, uh, in terms of discrimination against women in the federal government, and that's a powerful force. So I wanted to ask you, not only is this a really powerful force, but what other powerful forces do you see that's going to cope with Trump? Well, be before I speak about Trump, let me just say this, and that is that I, obviously I can only touch on a few things that are in the book uh, in this brief, um, these brief remarks. But I, when you read the book, I think you will be in surprised and I hope pleased to know that that commission that was appointed by Kennedy, Department is of Labor, right? Yes, was at the urging of Esther Peterson, right? Um, was is definitely credited here as being the beginning yep. of this uh, of the rise of the feminist establishment, which you know of course uh, is, is all a relative term. Uh, we the feminist movement always was um, never as felt like it was quite as establishment as its critics among conservatives said it was. But this period in by the 1970. Women like you who were working in jobs within the government and trying to change the bloomed. system from within are really some of the major figures in this book. Oh, good. And, um, and people like uh, uh, Virginia Allen, Catherine East, uh, yes. women whose oh, names know. are hardly household right. names but ought to be, were they almost like a names. feminist underground within the federal government. That's right, and my question is, what else do you see other than the federal government as being key players in coping with Trump? Well, I'm a little better at telling you what happened in the past than what's going to happen in the future, <laughs> being trained as a historian and all that. But uh, um, I think that there are going to be um, a lot, many organizations, uh, lots of NGOs, um, unions, um, lots of, of new NGOs, new groups, the resistance uh, that have sprung up all over the place since January. Um, and that have uh, some leaders that have popped up out of nowhere that are showing themselves to be full of imagination and skill. And I think also uh, every American who would like to continue to have health insurance is going to probably have a lot to say uh, in reaction to, to what's being proposed in Congress. Um, a lot of um, I know that even today, uh, 
Schumer and others were saying that Democrats should not rely just on opposition to Trump, but that they themselves needed to come up and say what we stand for as Democrats. Um, and so we can't all be relied on that. But I do believe that a lot of um, opposition will form and directly in response to Americans standing up for their own needs against some threats that are coming um, from that administration. That's the best I can help you with. So we yes. have time for one more question. So. Well, <laughs> it really wasn't a question. I ran into a friend as I was coming over, and she told me she heard you this morning. And I told her some things that I remembered. She said, oh, you've got to tell them. So, okay, okay. I don't know if they're really worth telling. But um, I was, when I was the director of the Maryland Commission for Women, we worked very hard to get the ERA through. Maryland was the eighth state. And your friend, Carmen Delgado Votaw, oh. who died yes. rather recently, was on the Maryland Commission. I remember her. I got to interview her. Did you? Yes. Great, great. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, one of the things, I, I left the commission and worked for the feds for a while, and they put me in charge of a lot in Houston. So there were... We really had fights we had to stop that were going on. There were all sorts of things happening. But one of the things that sticks in my mind, which is the women, the first ladies sitting on the stage together, all in their ultra suede skirt suits. That's what we wore then. And it, it was a wonderful, wonderful picture. Thank you very much for coming. And please tell me who you are.